Thessalonians, and this week we're moving uh, right into 2 Thessalonians. And so I want to do a little recap real quick, if you don't mind, uh, from our study of 1 Thessalonians. And you have Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. And Silvanus has been a faithful partner of Paul's. And if you remember, he was jailed with Paul in Philippi. And Timothy, he's been Paul's son in the faith. And Paul's been training him to succeed him when he would pass on eventually. And so you have Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy together when the church of Thessalonica was planted. Uh, they were together in Corinth with the writing of the first letter. And then now we're going to see in the writing of the second letter, they're together again. And this second letter is written roughly a few months after the first. And so Thessalonica was called the mother of Macedonia. It was home to roughly 250,000 people. And so the city was founded by one of the generals of Alexander the Great about 350 years before Paul arrived there. Now it was located on a seaport of the Aegean Sea. It was also located in route of the Ignatian Highway, which was one of the major east-west trade routes. As a result, it was a major trade center that was extremely busy and it brought together people from the east and the west. Now, with that scene in your mind, you would see there's much crime, murder, prostitution. All of that was rampant. Now, I'd imagine it would be like what we would see as modern-day downtown Chicago, New York, Las Vegas, or any one of the top ten U.S. cities, if you can picture what that would look like in your mind. So, that's where Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy planted this church. Remember, Paul was only there for three Sabbaths, but in, the amount, in that amount of time, God used him and the others to plant this church. Now, Paul was then forced to leave, and he was worried about the persecution that would continue, and that it would cause this very young church, these young Christians, uh, to stop meeting. So Paul sends his best, he sends Timothy, back to find out about their faith and how they were doing. Timothy comes back with a great report, which leads to Paul writing his first letter to them. After writing the first letter, Paul stayed in Corinth. He stayed there. He was there 18, 22 months roughly. And only a few months later, he writes that second letter, the one we're going to examine this morning and over the course of the next month or so. Now, here's the flow of 2 Thessalonians. If you have your Bible, I want you to look through it and use it as we go through the series. First, he writes on persecution and endurance, which has escalated uh, since the first letter. Now, second, the Thessalonians were still confused about the second coming of Christ. Remember, Paul addressed briefly the rapture and the day of the Lord, the judgment day, in his first letter to them. But confusion on these topics still remained most likely because false teachers arose. In fact, some of these false te uh, teachers even stated that the suffering they were experiencing meant that they were already living in the end. That confusion it created, the third part we'll see in this letter. And because they listened and believed some of the false teachings, some of them quit working. They became lazy and they started living off of everyone else. Now, one more important note, Paul writes this letter with a tone of love, a tone of tenderness and compassion to them. Even when he's admonishing them because of their sin. In fact, we notice immediately that he starts this letter by thanking God for them. And that will be the lens in which we will examine this first passage this morning as we examine why does Paul give thanks to God for this young church plan. If you have your Bibles open to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, where we will look at verses 1 through 5. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness 
and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Heavenly Father, as we would begin to study this second uh, letter, Lord Jesus, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us each individually, Father God, and then also as a church family. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would learn from this young church plant. And I pray also, Lord Jesus, that we would make a necessary application for our own lives and our church as well. Father God, I pray as always that we would uh, remove all distractions from our mind. And I pray, Father God, that as we would use our scriptures, we would uh, walk through the verses, Father God, and pay close attention to allowing your Holy Spirit to speak to us individually and again corporately as a church. Father, I pray we wouldn't be focused on the noise of the rain outside the door uh, where we're headed for lunch, but I pray, Father God, uh, we'd be focused on your word and the truth you want to preach to us. Father God, I pray this morning that you would increase and that we would decrease. Father, I pray for every pastor who is boldly proclaiming your word, whether those who are in free countries to do so or whether there are those who are in persecuted countries, uh, Father God, who are doing so. I pray, Father God, that you would embolden them and strengthen them and that, Father God, you would speak through them. And we pray revival would, Father God, reach the world for Christ. Father, we pray this in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. If you're taking notes, the sermon title is A Church to Be Thankful For. And as we look at verses 1 through 5 in 2 Thessalonians, we're going to look at five marks or attributes or virtues, however you want to word it, of what a healthy church or what a church uh, should look like and a church that Paul was thankful for looks like. And we're going to see in verses uh, 1 through 2, genuine conversion. In verses 3a, we're going to see increasing faith. In verse 3b, we're going to see growing love. In verse 4, we're going to see persevering hope. And then in verse 5, we're going to see a kingdom attitude. Now, look at verses 1 and 2, if you will. Have your Bibles. Uh, use those. Follow along in those verses. Notice the very first mark he focuses on. He reminds them of their genuine conversion. Now, Paul is shaping their identity as he writes to the church of the Thessalonians. You see, they have a new identity and a new direction in life. The Greek word for church was commonly used to refer to secular assemblies, and it comes from two Greek words which literally mean called out ones. Now, who were they called out from? The world, right? They were called out from the world. They were set apart. They were to be distinctive. They were to be different right? than the world around them. That's who they are. They have a new identity and as a result, a new purpose. They are the called out ones of Thessalonica. Now, Paul starts off by identifying this young church as being in God. And then he uses that word, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you notice that our, it's different. He didn't use that in his greeting in his first letter. He adds that now because they are now God's. They are his. God is their father together. Praise God, right? Paul is identifying in those statements their union with God and their union with Christ. You see, this is a regenerate, redeemed, Christ-centered church filled with genuinely converted followers of Christ. Is that a church to be thankful for? Because of their new identity, Paul reminds them that they are also recipients of God's ongoing grace and God's ongoing going peace. You remember we talked about those last week. Grace, again, as a reminder, is God's unmerited favor shown to us in the death of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Now in Romans 3.24, Paul says we are justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. We didn't do anything to earn our grace, did we? Praise God, right? Now this peace as we highlighted last Sunday, refers specifically to the total well-being, specifically to spiritual well-being that comes from being reconciled to God through Christ. 
You see, Jesus shed blood, paid the penalty of our sins, so that we are now at peace, those who are believers, with God. It also broke down the barriers between us and other people, so that we have peace with one another. Ephesians 2.14 reads, For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility. You know, and knowing that our sins are completely forgiven by God's grace alone gives us inner peace in the midst of life's trials. Isn't that important to remember that? Paul explains a little bit more about the depth of what this means later on, and we'll get into this in greater detail when we get to this chapter, but briefly let me mention it here. In 2 Thessalonians, if you flip ahead to chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, it reads, But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this He called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to grab the truth that Paul is reminding them here. You see, first, God loved them. God chose them. They were saved through the gospel by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and their faith in the truth so that they would obtain the glory of their Lord Jesus Christ. You see, again, this is a redeemed, genuinely converted church, the beloved of God, brought into salvation through the hearing of the gospel and the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and their faith in the truth. And now they're headed for eternal glory. So what we've seen so far in the start of this second letter and Paul's beautiful reminder to God of what he's thankful for this church for is that he's thanking God for their genuine conversion. And next, in verse 3a, we're going to see he's going to thank God that not only are they genuinely converted, but their faith is increasing. Look at verse 3a. Paul says, we ought, which in the Greek means we have a deep, obligation. This is something that we're bound to do. Paul uses the phrase, as is right, meaning that this is deserved that we give thanks to God for you because of the character of your life as a church, because your faith is growing abundantly. You know, Paul, he doesn't say here, he doesn't say, you know, Church of Thessalonica, because your congregation is massively growing in number. He doesn't say Church of Thessalonica because you've got the best instrumentalists and the best worship team with the best stage lighting and the best sound system around. He doesn't say because you've got the best cooked food, although ours is pretty good. He doesn't say, he doesn't say because you have the best men's or women's ministry around. He doesn't say because you have the best programming for children or youth. And, and because of that, it's greatly enlarged. Paul says we are thankful to God all the time for you and under obligation to express it. Because why? Because your what? Faith is greatly enlarged. Let's look back real quick to 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 3. He says, Remembering before our God and Father, your work of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, their faith was established, it began. But then he goes on later in that letter, in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 10, and he says, Paul says, As we pray most earnestly night and day, that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. You see, what is he reminding them in that first letter? That their faith needs, what, maturing, right? That's the progressive part of sanctification that we talked about, isn't it? Is there anyone in this room who doesn't need that? That's a pretty good prayer, right? God, make their faith continue to increase and grow. And then in 2 Thessalonians 1.3, what do we see happen? It says what? Your faith is what? Growing abundantly. What we see here is Paul's prayers. They've been answered what makes it even more amazing is that it was growing abundantly. You know what's crazy is it was growing abundantly, and, and we know 
through what? Because we have this book, but it was growing abundantly under what? Heavy persecution. Can you imagine? They're the only believers in this city of 250,000. How easy it would be for them to do what? Walk away, right? Teenagers, sometimes when they're the only Christians at their school, it's easy for them because it's so hard to stand out, right? Sometimes when we're in our work environments and everybody isn't a believer, it's so hard for us to stand out for our faith, right? Imagine this young church in a city of 250,000. They're the only ones. And it doesn't say that they're shrinking from their faith, that they're walking away from their faith. It says that under heavy persecution, their faith continues to grow, but not just grow, abundantly grow. Is that powerful? Is that powerful? There's a principle here that I think we need to grab hold of. You see, the principle is this. Persecution destroys false faith. Think about that for a moment. That's why the prosperity gospel preachers don't want to preach that, do they? Matthew 13, 20 and 21 reads, As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises, on the account of the word, immediately falls away. You see, Jesus taught on the seed that fell into the rocky ground. The plant came up for a while, but as soon as persecution came, what happened to that plant? It what? Died. It died. You see, the second part to that principle is this, is persecution never destroys true faith. Philippians 1.6 and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. You see, persecution produces a pure church because persecution drives the true believer to Christ. Grab that. Job went through heavy persecution in his life as Satan was trying to sift him, right? And yet, what did it do? It drove him closer and closer to who? God, it continued to sanctify Him. How many people do you know where when persecution and trials and hardships come, they just walk away? But you see, those who are His, when persecution comes, it drives us closer and closer to Him because we start doing what? You ever been there? In a moment where you knew nothing else to do, but you simply got on your knees and you prayed because you had nowhere else to turn. I think we can all picture moments when we have been there in that situation. Second Corinthians 12, 7-10, through 10, it says, So to keep me from becoming conceited, this is Paul writing to the church of Corinth, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, what? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in the weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. And here's the best part of it. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, Paul had a thorn in, the, in his flesh. Where did he turn? Three times he turned to the Lord Trouble, persecution, distress, affliction, pain, they all drive the true believer to their knees, to their Heavenly Father. These difficult times resulted in Paul knowing his Father deeper, and as a result, this led to deeper trust. You see, the more that you know Jesus, the more you trust Jesus, and that's how trust grows. That's how our faith grows. So far, we've seen a church to be thankful for has genuine converted people
They're increasing in faith. And next in verse 3b, Paul thanks God because they are growing in love. Now let's look back again, once again, to uh, chapter 1, verse 3 of 1 Thessalonians. Remembering before our God and Father your labor of love in our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, they were laboring in love. Immediately, what did they do as the genuinely converted? They started loving God and loving others well. But then what happens, Paul reminds them in his letter in 3.12, he says, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. Paul was praying for them for increase because they were going through times, if you remember, of tension. Remember, there were busy bodies. There were the idle-minded, those who weren't working, who were causing problems in the church. And so he reminds them, continue to persevere through this and continue to love one another well. And Paul was praying that for them. And then what do we see here in 2 Thessalonians 1.3b? Once again, we see this pattern. Paul's prayer was what? Answered. They were growing in love for one another. You know, what's amazing here, it says all of them. No one singled out. They were all growing in love. And you see, that's the mark of a true believer. And you look at the mark of a growing, healthy church. This is that part of progressive sanctification, isn't it? Sometimes we struggle with difficult people. Even sometimes we struggle with difficult people in a church. But that's part of sanctifying us, isn't it? Right? Look around. Don't look at your spouse and tell them, hey, thank you for sanctifying me. Some of you guys didn't listen. We've got to start seeing people as Jesus sees them, don't we? And that the mark, right, of what true Christ followers do is we see people as Christ sees them. We see this in John 13, 34. Through 35, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You, are, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Well, how did Jesus love? Remember, what was he doing on the cross? What did he pray? Father, what? And even the guys who were spitting on him? Even the guys who were mocking him, putting a thorn on his head? He was calling for the Father to forgive him? What about Stephen? Stephen's being stoned because he was preaching the truth. What did he say? Forgive what? Forgive who? He wasn't cussing at him. How many of us would be saying, Father, forgive them as he pelts you in the eye? Stephen was saying that, right? Paul, he, now let's get to Paul. You got Jesus, Stephen. Now there's Paul, this guy who was, he was in his 20s roughly, watching Stephen being stoned and Paul has this Damascus Road experience, and now Paul is being uh, stoned and left for dead and dragged out of cities, right, as he's sharing the gospel. Well, what's Paul do? He keeps going back where? To those cities. He's even in prison. What's he do while he's in prison? He's singing praise songs. Wait a second. What's the pattern we're seeing here? We see this pattern of how Jesus loved, of how Stephen loved, of how Paul loved. You see, Timothy's with him in this, right? Timothy is his young mentee. What's Timothy learning? How to what? Love. You see, these disciples, they're learning as they're with Jesus how to love. This church of Thessalonica is learning from Paul and the others how to what? How to love one another. And they take that and they pass it down. And if we do this correctly, right, it passes down from what? From one church to the next church to the next church to where are we today? We should be that same church that's modeling what? That same behavior that we're what? Loving one another. As Christ's love. Well, how do you do it? we got to get I out of the equation, don't we? Oof. That should hit some of us pretty hard. That should hit us hard. Matthew 22, 37 and 39, And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. When we get the vertical right, when we're loving God well, we're going to do what horizontally? Love our neighbors well. Right? If we get the first four commandments right, we're going to get the next six right, aren't we? But if we don't get the first four right, are we going to love others well? Sometimes if we're not loving others well, it's probably an indication that we don't have the vertical right, do we? This isn't complicated, right? But it starts with our relationship where? What we see Paul being thankful for was that 
these genuine converted Christians were being persecuted, and yet while being persecuted, they had growing faith and they had growing love. Incredibly powerful. I saw this, I saw this firsthand in Poland. When I was there a year ago with the refugees from Ukraine, I saw this firsthand as the refugees would serve the meals they would cook, prepare, and they would serve them to the little children as they were serving them to the adults and all the people who were uh, fleeing from all the different persecutions that they were facing. So many stories unbearable to hear and tell, and yet the fun we had sometimes just grabbing snowballs and throwing them at children and just having a good time there. I saw this love of Christ for one another. Even in the midst of persecution, I saw this group of people that when they went to sing, when we had a church service, they weren't complaining. They weren't grumbling about their situation, their circumstance. The fact that they've been removed from their homeland, they lost everything that they had. They had to make choices between thick coats and thin coats because they had needed more room in their cars. They didn't complain. They didn't grumble about any of that. When they got into the worship service, you know what they did? They worshiped Jesus. You know what they did at the refugee site? They loved one another. Amazing what happens in some of the most dire times and circumstances. And we see what should take place in a church is we should see the love for one another that is continually growing. As we move on, look at verse 4. We're going to see the next mark Paul thanks God for. He thanks God for their persevering hope. Look at that. Again, let's go back. 1-3, 1 Thessalonians. Remembering before God and Father, our God and Father, your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, their steadfastness of hope was established. And then in, again in 1 Thessalonians 3, 4 through 5, what we see is Paul is praying for it again. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as has as, as come to pass. And just as you know, for this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. You see, Paul's fear was that in trying times, and then with the persecution that these Christians were so young, they were babes in Christ, that it would cause them to what? Walk away from the faith. You ever been there? You're mentoring somebody and you know Satan's going to come? It's hard, isn't it? Because it's hard to explain it to them, right? But you know when you surrender your life to Christ, we automatically know that Satan's going to come on attack. And it's hard to just explain that. And so you're, you want to be with them when they go through that period because you want to help them get through it. Imagine, here's Paul. He can't go back. He knows his heart's broken. And he prays that for God. Right, And so he even goes a step further and he sends Timothy to go back and he comes back and he gives the report. And then in 2 Thessalonians 1.4, we see Paul's pattern of answered prayers continues as he says, Therefore we ourselves boast about you and the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. You see, Paul is proud of them for what God is doing in their perseverance through their persecutions and afflictions in their enduring faithfulness. Through all their persecutions, through everything they've been enduring, they are steadfast and they stay faithful. They refuse to give up. They remain hopeful. And Paul says, this is a church to be thankful for. Paul adds one more mark. One more mark and he sees in this church that he thanks God for. Look in verse 5. He says it's their, thank, their kingdom attitude. Look at verse 5 with me. This is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. You see, they had the right perspective and the right attitude about suffering. Paul's writing them that their faithfulness through all of this suffering is indication, it's proof, it's evidence of God's righteous judgment. What does this mean in simpler terms? Well, he's telling them that they're not suffering because they're bad people, right? but because they're kingdom people. They're suffering for the kingdom's sake, and part of that suffering God is using to purge, to prune, to chase, and to cleanse, to make them ready to receive the full glory of the kingdom. Now, I love this quote, how James Grant explains this. He says, Their current suffering is evidence that God has judged rightly, that they are indeed His people, he adds, that is the exact opposite of what we think when we're suffering. Now think about this. Our immediate reaction to suffering and trials is that God is angry with us. Have you ever been there? 
felt that way, that God is paying us back for something. When we go through trials, the various hardships, pains in life, we are immediately inclined to think that God is angry with us, that we've done something wrong. But that's the wrong perspective. Paul wants us to think differently. If we continue to trust God through our trials and afflictions, that the perseverance of faith in trials is evidence that God's judgment has been passed upon us and we are part of His kingdom. Now, Grant adds, he says, if Paul is saying that we have been judged by God and declared righteous and our suffering is evidence of being worthy of God's kingdom, then that view should completely and drastically change our perspective in suffering. In the midst of our trials, we should have a different perspective. Instead of throwing in the towel, which many of us know many people who have, and giving up, we continue to trust in the Lord. In the midst of our trials, we need to grow in faith, love each other, and remain steadfast in hope. In order for that to happen, we have to believe that God is for us. If we actually believe that our perspective on sufferings and trials will change, instead of viewing them as signs of God's anger, we can look at them as evidence of God's grace, demonstrating that we are worthy of the kingdom. You see, our perspective on suffering has to change, doesn't it? It has to change. How we look at it, how we view it, how we respond to it determines how others see us as Christ followers, doesn't it? We should respond differently. They should see in us something different that they say, you know, I want what he has. He's here in the hospital going through this diagnosis of cancer, but there's something different about the peace that he has. I want that peace. You see, that's how we respond is part of our witness and our testimony of what we believe, isn't it? Well, how does Paul reveal they were genuinely converted? He explains they had increasing faith under persecution. They had growing love under affliction. And they had persevering hope under trials. And they had a kingdom attitude that endured under persecution. And for all of that, Paul was thankful to God for this church. Now, questions I want you to think about. Have I surrendered my life to Christ? Have you given God everything? Every area of your life, have you surrendered your life completely to Christ? It's one. Is your faith increasing? Can you see your faith has been increasing since the day you surrendered your life to Christ? Is your love for God and for others growing in your faith? Can you see growth in how you love God and love others? Is your hope persevering? In the midst of trials, difficulties, persecutions, is your hope persevering? And do you have a kingdom attitude? A kingdom mindset knowing that this is not our home. So how are you doing? How are we doing as a church? We're going to come to a time of invitation at this time and I'm doing that first before we go into communion, mainly because if there's anyone in here who has never surrendered their life to Christ, I pray you would make that decision, and then you can partake in the communion with us as your first and beautiful time to do so. And so I want to give that opportunity. What's God speaking to your heart? I pray you would respond accordingly. Father God, I pray, I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would grab hold of Your truth by the work of Your Holy Spirit speaking to each person in this room that You have brought here for a specific purpose. I pray, Lord, that You would speak to us as a church, Father God, that which You would have for us. Father, I also uh, come to You, Lord, right now, and I ask that if there is anyone in this room who has never surrendered their life to You, Father God, they would come and uh, do that now, and they would come talk to me about that, Lord. I pray that if there's any other decision anyone needs to make, whether it's following through with believers baptism by immersion, whether it's joining the church and membership, whether it's just simply coming to the altar and uh, Father God just praying and asking 
uh, Father God, for your help through the Holy Spirit to get back on track. Whatever it is, whatever we need to do, I pray we do that. Maybe it's simply praying for somebody, a loved one, or somebody we know, uh, Father God, who uh, is on our heart and who right now, even in this moment, you're placing on our heart to pray for. Just like Paul prayed for this church, maybe that's what we're called to do and come to the altar and pray, Father. But also, Lord Jesus, as we come to a time of communion, I'm also reminded of the importance that, Father God, if there's any grievance we have towards anyone or one another in the room, that, Father God, we need to make that right with you. And so I pray that if maybe it's just going up to somebody, giving them a hug, telling them that they love them, and, uh, Father God, just simply praying with them right where they're at, I pray we would do that as well, too. Father, you know each of our hearts, where we're at, and what we need to do to respond, and I pray that we'd respond accordingly. Father, I pray this in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. As the music